Right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was having a chat with somebody about this earlier. And before I actually begin the talk, I'd like to read you a very famous film quote that really resonates with what I found while I was doing this research. If you haven't seen the film, you know, you've probably been living under a rock. So, um, because I can't memorize the bloody quote. So, this is really will resonate with what you'll see here. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships and fire off the shoulder of Orion. Watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears and rain. Time to die. So, um, that resonates a lot with the subject matter of this, um, which is a talk about complete fucking train wrecks and disasters that are in your fucking house right now. So um, hopefully my computer will stop being shit. So who am I? Um, security researcher at Xyphos. Um, one of my favorite things to do is dick about with embedded stuff. Um, routers, switches, anything that's a bit weird I like to play with. Um, I've been jabbing at it for ages. I mean, it's always been a bit of a passion of mine. Um, before this, I was a forensic student. Um, I actually qualified in that. Um, so I'm actually a forensics person, allegedly. Um, I can do fingerprints. Um, before that, I was a pharmaceutical student. And before that, I was an internet miscreant causing havoc, which uh, led to some consequences, but whatever. I fucking hate XML. Um, <laughs> XML can die in a fire, which is really unfortunate because just about every single thing that I'm going to talk about today involves XML. So it's like I was studying the things I hate. So um, what I'm actually going to talk about is TR064, um, how it's shit, and related stuff, vulnerabilities that have been related to it, some kind of protocol level issues where the specification specifically makes shit terrible, um, you know, and why some really bad things have happened. And I'm also going to talk about TR069 and why it's a terrible idea. I'll go into a bit of back history about some of the stuff that's happened in the past, some of the prior art, because it's always important to, you know, check that somebody else hasn't done what you're doing first. Um, and then I'll tell you how to pop ACS servers uh, take over the world um, for little to no effort. So if you you want some you know, global domination, you're going to get it here. And there's some other nonsense that's in there in no order, um, because I'm really crap at ordering slides, so it's all in there somewhere. So before we begin, um, I'd like to point out that there is some brilliant prior art in this field. Um, Shahar Tal, he was with Checkpoint at the time, and now he's with Celebrite. Um, he gave a couple of talks. He gave the iHunt TR069 admins talk. Um, I think that was DEF CON. And then there was the misfortune cookie research that I saw at CCC at 31C3. Um, brilliant pieces of work. It's worth checking out. And that's kind of the prior art that got me interested in TR069 again, because I'd looked at it before, and I'd kind of gone, eh, I'll look at something else. And then Shahar was like, hey, shit's fucked, yo. And I was like, well, of course shit's fucked. It's TR069. And it was like, no, no, but you should look at this. Shit's fucked when I saw his talk. And I was like, oh, 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 whoa, 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 this is bad. So I went and had a look, and I saw some things. Um, there's fun stuff there for everyone. You can have cutting edge research tomorrow if you just take a look at it. Um, also, in the slides, I'll have a couple links to the specifications of the protocols that I'm going to be talking about. And I'd advise reading them. I'd advise getting some coffee. Um, they're quite lengthy. They're really dull, and I'd also advise like having a counselor or a psychiatrist and call because you'll go fucking mad trying to make sense of them. So yeah, have a go for yourself. You will find some stuff. So what is TR blah blah blah? TR blah blah. It's uh, protocol specifications. They're not RFCs like we know RFCs like all the nonsense we used to as an RFC, like TCP and DNS and all that crap. TR blah 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 are DSL form specs. They're made by a bunch of idiots who like to design things by committee. And it's basically a specification for how broadband works. And these were thought up by people who didn't have a Scooby. And they made things up by you know, having committees and then the subcommittee of the subcommittee of the subcommittee. And I think one of them probably was like working for a vendor that sold an XML parser, because all of this shit involves XML. Um, it defines the specs. Um, for the protocols for managing broadband networks for ISPs. 
So this is stuff that I don't think BT use it, but a couple of other UK ISPs use it, and we'll get to that in a bit, and that's going to be comedy gold. So um, <laughs> these are specs that you can follow, you can implement, you can ignore, you can completely disregard, um, and they manage a lot of stuff. So what I'm going to be interested to say is the 064 and 069 ones. There's a whole bunch of others in that namespace, and they're all terrible. Like, there's TR111, which is TR069, but for shit inside your LAN, like your smart TV. And that's going to be the worst idea in the world, and they're pushing to have it implemented. And yeah, I mean, I need to look that in the future, because it's a bundle of crap, and they're actively pushing to have this pushed out. Um, so yeah, TR064 to start is called a LAN-side DSL CPE configuration. Um, yeah. So. The spec outlines this SOAP-based protocol because everyone loves XML, and you don't have enough XML because you just want more fucking XML, because XML parses the most robust piece of software in the world, allegedly. And so it allows configuration of your CPE, consumer premises equipment, um, i.e. your router that your ISP shipped to you from the LAN side. So back in the day, for those that, for at least people, you know, I'm not sure how it was in the UK, but in Ireland, when Aircom rolled out broadband, you got your router, you plugged your router in, and you got a CD that ran, had a Microsoft Windows executable on it that you put into your Windows XP machine, because this was when we got broadband. You put it in, you ran a program. And the program configured your router and gave you internet. And magic, your broadband, it was slightly faster than dial-up. Like, just slightly. It was like dial-up without the noise. So it was dial-up without the free chip tunes. So, um, yeah, you know, TR64 was for the uh, broadband setup bullshit they shipped to consumers. And the specification is there. Um, download it, read it, cringe, smash your head off the desk. Um, it's worth a look. It's comedy gold. So TR69 is CPE, consumer premise equipment, WAN management protocol, CWMP. And these guys love their fucking acronyms. So it outlines how, from the ISP end, how the ISP manages your router, how they access it, how when you go, hello, tech support, my router don't work, they can log into your router remotely, and they can check shit, and they can go, oh, you've got like 500 devices connected to your router. Of course it doesn't bloody work. Or they can go, oh, your router's in a fault state. Turn it off and turn it back on again. It's the protocol they use for managing it. Um, it's a management protocol. and. It's, again, SOAP. And when you look at it at first, you go, nope. Because SOAP means nope. Just say no. It's a bit like string copy. Just say no. It's a gateway drug to bad shit. So um, you can download the spec there. It's on Amendment fucking 5. I wouldn't be surprised if they go to Amendment 6 soon. And yeah, have a look. It's hideous. So. I'm going to start with TRO64 because TRO64 kind of hit everybody, kind of blindsided them. So it's on the, you know, it's what they use for the broadband setup CD stuff, and it's how you manage the CPE from the LAN side, you know, from inside the trusted zone. It's how you manage the device. It's a spec for doing that, and it is total read-write for like all the config variables on the device. So you can overwrite DNS servers or the NTP servers or whatever. Um, wireless security settings, you can get and set the keys, the SSID, all that. Any of the crap you can access through the web interface, you can access using this in a lot of cases. And when I read the spec, I did a double take and thought I was hallucinating on some shit because I saw that it had a section called security, about security requirements. And I only read the spec after I've been taking a good look at it by reversing something. So I oh, whoa, 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 stall the ball. There's actually a section here that says security when this shit's fucked. So um, the TR-064 security specification states, access to any action that allows configuration changes to the CPE must be password protected. Access to any password protected action must require HTTP digest authentication. Sensitive information such as passwords must not be readable at all. And it's also, it doesn't specify it in the spec, but it's implied that it's only meant to listen on the LAN side of the network. But, you know, we know where this one goes. You, you, you know, you might as well go to Matthew's talk about anonymous credentials and shit, because it's going to be way more complicated than this stuff, and it's going to be way more interesting. Um, shout out to him. He's doing some cool stuff. He's in track two. So if, if you see where the wind's going now and you want to just walk out and vomit and see something cool, go to track two. 
because um, this is going to be bad. So, um, yeah, I quite like this. You know, when they say must, implementation people go, eh, maybe, next version. Uh, it's a tick in gyra, fuck it, we'll fix it later. So, you know, dreams and reality will eventually collide, and, you know, we'll have a nice, glorious place where specifications will be followed, and words like must, can, and cannot will mean what they mean in English. But the glue sniffing fuckwits who implement this shit, these words are like vague notions somewhere the fuck over there where it's like, oh, must, uh, maybe we'll stick it as a ticket, you know, next version, or eh, it's not a critical issue, we'll sort it out later. So, um, the reality is this shit, and why I call TRO6 fail is password protect, oh fuck no. I've only seen a couple of devices that actually fucking support having passwords for TRO64. Those are Fritzbox and some other shit that was a bit weird. Um, that bit about not being able to read your passwords, ah, that's really hard. You know, you can actually just pull the creds from the box. So um, Wi-Fi keys are readable in plain text if you send the right SOAP request. That'll lead me into something funny in a bit. Uh, oh, and that bit about, you know, um, not listening on WAN, you know, only listening on a fuck no, 0.0.0.0 is where we bind our services. <laughs> all access, all the time, maximum portability. Oh, and it just so happens that because a bunch of this crap calls out the shell, we've got bonus command injection bugs, because, you know, we want the whole OWASP top 10, it's bug bingo, baby. <laughs> so, obvious outcome. Where does this end? You know, what happens, you know, what happens when you put this shit on the internet at scale, where pretty much most of you people in this fucking audience have a box in your house with this shit on it right fucking now in your trusted network. A lot of your clients will have this shit in their trusted zone. You know, it'll be in the, you know, it's, oh, yeah, it's inside our LAN, it's cool. No, fuck that, this shit's listening to the internet. So what's the outcome? What happened? This was... Like, somebody had gotten, like, a big pile of flammable shit, poured petrol on it, and then put a sign saying smoking area beside it. It was an accident waiting to happen. And guess what? Shit happened. Shit happened. So, um, El Reg wrote this beautiful thing. So the first kind of indicator that stuff was going deeply wrong with the internet was when Deutsche Telekom had some issues when like a million people suddenly can't connect to the internet in Germany, a country that's quite well connected, you got some problems, because uh, some stuff happened. And people kind of twigged. This isn't just going to happen in Germany, but it was too fucking late. It was already game over. Game was over a long time ago, but it happened Talk Talk, post office, Aircom in Ireland, my home country, uh, my favorite ISP I've been stuck with forever because nobody else serviced my area. Uh, Demon, um, basically every fucker who ships ship routers to people had some issues. So ship, stuff was getting wrecked. Um, outages, outages everywhere. Worm, you know, I got really excited and kind of giggled a bit about this and probably nearly wet myself because somebody had written a fucking worm that did worm things. You know, and it was hilarious. Just, just the scale of the chaos this caused. And it was, you'll, we'll get to why in a minute, but yeah, the, the complete fucking mayhem that this accident waiting to happen caused, this accident did fucking happen, and it probably affected some people in this room. So, um, who did it? Where's the attribution party? Can I roll my dice and say North Korea? Was it Russia? Was it Iran? Was it China? No, mate. Script kiddies. It was scrub lords who want to DDoS things and they accidentally took out the internet for shitloads of people. Kind of bonus win. You try build a botnet to packet people and you accidentally, you know, fuck the internet for loads of people instead. So that one was, um, um, yeah, that's pretty difficult to read because lol syntax highlighting, etc. But basically, you send a SOAP request within spec saying, change the NTP server you're using to backtick some fucking commands here and it'll run the commands, and because it's internet of shit, it'll run it as root, because there ain't no user but root. Um, so yeah, you know, the predictable happened. Somebody went, this is trivially exploitable. I'll make botnet. Um, and yeah, the, the expected occurred. 
So here we've got, because uh, you have to have a screenshot of IDA Pro if you're talking about malware or worms, otherwise no motherfucker takes it seriously. IDA Pro screenshots are how people know that you know what you're fucking talking about in this industry. So here we've got a screenshot of IDA Pro that tells you absolutely nothing except that the thing is sending a SOAP request. So malware happened, that's the proof. I opened it up in IDA. So this ain't the first time either. You know, IDA is like, the shit when it comes to attribution. So this wasn't the first time we had some problems with the particular piece of software, Rompager, that caused this accident to occur. So before tr 6 fail, which is what I named it, there was Misfortune Cookie. It affected the same Rompager piece of software, except affected the 069 component. It allowed remotely accessing the device with no auth, because fuck off, um, due to what was effectively like the bug with um, misfortune cookie was actually really fascinating. When Shahar was giving his presentation, he didn't give the game away. He didn't tell you how to exploit the bug, you know, because they were still trying to get it fixed and it was a global problem. But me and one of the guys who ran a workshop earlier were sitting in the talk and we saw that it was what he was describing was a right what where. You could clobber global variables used by the device by sticking shit in a cookie. So you'll see what I mean in a second. I got somebody far smarter than me, wrote a reliable exploit for it. Um, and this is all you send. You send, this is like a snippet from the proof of concept exploit that Kenzo wrote. Now, Kenzo's an interesting chap because I have no idea who he is. He discovered the other vulnerability as well. He's some Irish dude. Um, I've no idea who he is. Ireland's a pretty small country, so we all kind of know each other. And this wild card comes out of the blue and starts like writing exploits for all the things and just causes havoc and then disappears off the face of the earth. So what's interesting with Misfortune Cookie is that so you've got these key value pairs and cookies. We all know how cookies work. Now, with Misfortune Cookie, the key in the cookie was basically represented an offset to clobber, and the value is what the fuck you want to clobber the offset with. So it's the most trivially exploitable bug of all time. All you do is take apart the firmware, find the binary, go, oh, here's where the bit that says requires a password to log in lives, and clobber it with Ah, nah, mate, it's all fine. Or authentication successful. So, you know, it, yeah, pretty grim. And this particular value here will exploit the blah, 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 rebranded Zixel piece of crap that Aircom ship everyone. There's one at my parents' house. I looked at it and I was like, oh. My parents actually got hit by the TRO64 worm. Um, Aircom sent out an advisory to all their customers saying, um, yo, you might want to change your wireless password because uh, somebody jacked it. Some Beeb reporter went to TalkTalk Talk with 100 TalkTalk Talk customers' Wi-Fi keys that got stolen and got dumped online and went, yo, um, yeah, uh, your customers, not only does their internet not work anymore, but their Wi-Fi passwords have been jacked and TalkTalk Talk being TalkTalk Talk just said, no, 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 didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. Only 100 of them, only 100 of them. We've only seen 100. I've seen the dump. I stumbled across it by asking and begging and going, who the fuck did this shit? And eventually I got a hold of it. The 77,000 TalkTalk Talk customers who you can just connect to their Wi-Fi because the creds are on the fucking internet. Um, those creds also incidentally happen to be the admin passwords for a lot of their routers because lol TalkTalk. Talk. Um, you know, we kind of know what to expect from TalkTalk. Talk. I mean, you know, SQLi in 2016 and now we've got this, you know, it's the norm. Uh, I feel sorry for them though, they're kind of fucked legacy stuff, or they're implementing what they're told to implement, because best practice. So with 069, 069 again is a DSL forum specification. It again has a little bit in it about, you know, doing security, um, because apparently you have to put in a little notice saying do security, and, you know, so people can ignore it, so at least it's there. But 069 is a bit more, it supports TLS, it supports authentication. The protocol's a mess, um, as I've said before, I'm not going to complain about that much more. It's just a disaster. Um, it's basically like everyone and their mum brought the technology they liked to the table. And when they were, they were designing the protocol, they said, OK, we'll keep you all happy. We'll put all of it in. You know, we'll make it do everything. The kitchen sinks in there. So you've got the SLTLS. It's optional. Um, some setups are decent. You can have mutual auth. You can have client. Cert, you can have client-side certs, you can have cert pinning, all this other gubbins. And other people just, you know, YOLO plain text because fuck crypto, crypto's hard. You can do auth as well. So um, 
in a lot of cases, the router to the ACS, the ACS is the device at the ISP that controls all of the shit. It's like the best botnet command and control server in the world because it's designed to do that. Um, you can use basic auth so you can authenticate your clients, or you can use the shared secret, or you can use client certs or whatever. In a lot of cases, I found um, the CPU to ACS bit is kind of irrelevant. What they're interested in is they'll have a static password for all their customers, and the username will be an identifier. The username will be a per device ID, so they can you know, go, oh, this is Joe Blog's router. Oh, he's having a bit of a problem. It's out of sync. We'll just reboot it remotely. Um, or we can snoop his traffic, et cetera, et cetera, because there's a lot of undocumented shit in some of the implementations. But you know, it's not as if they're going to spy on you. But TR69, um, it's XML. It's SOAP. But it's got other XML shit as well, because you know, if, you want, if you're doing stuff with XML, you might as well put more XML. So you've got STUN, you've got SOAP, you've got UPnP, you've got XMPP, and you've got basically any protocol you can think of that involves a bit of SOAP or a bit of XML, they'll probably jam it in. Which means you've got the world's greatest attack surface. Because I looked at this shit and I went, whoa, I don't even know where to start with fuzzing this. You know, this is, this is a bit too much. This is too hot to handle. So we know the CPN. We all know that embedded device and routers are fucked. You know, routers are routers. They're going to route, you know, they're going to have hard coded creds, blah, blah, blah. They're going to get wrecked by any, blah, blah, blah. But you know, OK, they ship crap devices to consumers, but surely the ISP, because they do billing and stuff, they're going you know, to have their shit together. They're an internet service provider. You think they know something about internet? So um, of course it's going to be rock solid enterprise software, you know, probably written by, I don't know, the IBMs, the Oracles of the ISP world or whatever. And it can't be that bad because you know, it's enterprise. And it's used by serious people with billions of dollars involved, or billions of pounds, or billions of euros, or billions of, well, quadrillions of yen. You know, there's, there's a shit ton of money there. They use this stuff for billing. So of course it's going to be secure, right? Because ISPs like making money. It's kind of their job. So that's what I want to talk about in the second act of this, in which we hack the planet. Because rock solid enterprise software can go fuck itself. So. Um, we're going to talk about world domination. And this kind of sums it up. And this is what you can do right now with the state of affairs things are because lol. So, we're so I, you know, when I was thinking the threat model of this after Annie happened, I sat down and I said to myself, what's the realistic threat model? And I had to think through, oh, it'll be Iran or China or nation state. And I thought, no, sod that. I'm not man I fire rant. I'm not fucking clown strike. I'm me. So I'm going to think like a 15-year-old script kitty who wants to make the biggest DDoS botnet on the planet, because that's what happened with previous vulnerabilities. So we want to own loads of routers everywhere to do some crime, right? That's the threat model, is some idiot going, I want to pop all this shit, and I want to do some serious crime. So, um, but we pick a lazy 15-year-old. I've been a lazy 15-year-old. I, I know what the mindset's like. It's like, Oh, uh, I could get, you know, botnet and scan and hack all these devices one at a time, but no, oh, mate, that's like effort and stuff. And I want this cheap, I want this quick, I want this easy. Um, I don't want to rent a big box, the gigabit pipe to scan, because that's a chore. My mom's credit card won't stretch that far. Um, I want to do this on the cheap. We want to nail all the shit in one go. So we do. So we take. So by the way, if you're looking for like advanced memory corruption or stuff, I'd advise going somewhere else, because all the bugs in this are disappointingly hilarious. Um, you're not going to find some advanced ROP chain bullshit like with browsers. This is going to be like entry level stuff, because my threat model was 15 year old. So um, you know, some of you might have kids. You know, your kids could probably pull this shit off overnight faster than me. So um, we want them all in one go, so we figure. You know, we have a thing. We've got a slightly smart 15-year-old, you know, who goes, OK, so I want to hack loads of boxes. So I hack the box that has access to all the boxes. So we've got somebody who's got a bit of a clue. We've got somebody who can read. So we've got a literate 15-year-old who's got, like, enough patience to wade through a few pages of stuff before they go, oh, fuck this. So I started auditing um, 
ACS server is my free time, just kind of a bit of a hobby project initially before I thought I'd give a talk on it. I was like, this will be fun, and I'll just have a look for the really low-hanging fruit. We found, I mean, I don't, you know, there's probably a load of fruit in the tree, but like, you're knee deep in low hanging fruit here. I have, you know, you'll see in a minute. It's like you're in an orchard and all the apples just drop on your fucking head. And you go, oh, okay then. Don't even need to pick them, they're just there. So, so far, um, I've done a quick and dirty audit with the attention span of a bored 15 year old of free ACS, which is shit because it's written in Java. Uh, OpenACS, again, crap. LibreACS, which I found out a bit of time in, was actually a fork of OpenACS. Same bullshit, not maintained, bad documentation, um, terrible Java crap. Um, and then I looked at somebody written a Tier 069 server library in PHP using Laravel and all this, you know, PHP developer nonsense. So I was like, it's PHP. I mean, they're basically glue sniffing monkeys. Um, I'll find an easy win there. Um, and people might find it a bit funny to look at. So yeah, I had a quick look. I found something within two minutes. We'll get to that in a bit. So the disclosure timeline for the first bug with free ACS. Um, at some point in the last while, I can't remember when, I found some bugs. Um, between then and April, I worked on weaponizing the bugs. Um, April, I disclosed them. Now, they haven't fixed them yet. So you can take the exploit from today and run rampant the internet and cause chaos and be the bored 15-year-old that 15-year-old you wanted you to be or something. That's a very clunky sentence, but you get what I mean. So free ACS has been around for a while, and you know it, it's, it's been around the block. And I'm not sure if it's a very small group of developers, like two of them, or one person, or one person with schizophrenia, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, it seems to be a one-man operation. And it says that, you know, it says a lot of things. And it's based on Tomcat Java and my sequel. So I was like, okay then. Things I hate. Um, so they call themselves the most complete tier 069 ACS available for free under the MIT license. That's copy pasted from their website. So most complete to me rings alarm bells of most attack surface. So, and um, by the way, with regards to attack surface, I have not even scratched the surface. The surface is pretty much intact. If you go digging for bugs, you will find heaps of them. You will give up because you will find bugs that make your other bug unexploitable because it's so fucking buggy. We'll get to that in a minute. There's bugs in your bugs. So how do you install free ACS? Um, so you wget the shell script over plain text HTTP, you chmod it, and you run it as root. And that's how you install it. And then you read chapter four, do the other 10% of the nonsense to make it work. And even then, it barely works. And this is things that, you know, you'll see it's, it's out there. People use this. And so I looked. And I created some Shodan and Google queries. Um, I did some stuff with Census and Bing, because there were some default logins, admin and XAPS. And nobody changes default creds. Default creds are default, you know? You leave them. You make a new user or something. And finding how to change the password took me a few minutes when I set up my local one. I was like, where the hell is the password change form? It's not here. It's not here. Most sysadmins go, yeah, screw it, it'll be fine. Um, there's quite a few on the internet. The lovely people at Binary Edge ran some scans, and they found quite a few. So, you know, there's a lot of these out there in production at some quite large ISPs um, on the public internet. So you can find them, Google, Bing, whatever. Um, so then I started looking, and I thought, I'll look at PostAuth first and get a feel for what the application is. And what I discovered is it's basically it's like a cross-site scripting testbed that optionally has like an ACS server as a bonus. Um, you can just you stick in any JS anywhere, and you'll get some XSS out somewhere. And these were all post-auth bugs, which I wasn't very interested in. But there's some screenshots just, just so you can see what kind of stuff I was dealing with. So I was like, oh, OK then. We got an alert box, followed by we got another alert box. Followed by, I've started a number of my fucking alert boxes because there's alert boxes in my alert boxes. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, this would be a really good project for, like, find a cross site scripting bug. It's like the XSS testbed. You can probably use it as a good benchmark for XSS finding tools. 
So, but we don't care about post auth. We want pre auth. We don't want to rely on default creds or brute forcing a login or stealing some creds. We want pre auth. We don't want to have to deal with silly nonsense like passwords. It needs to be remote. We don't want any of these local bugs. So, this cut down my scope. It needs to give us privileged access. It needs to either give us root in the box or an admin account in the ACS. And it needs to be easy, because again, threat model is bored 15 year old. You know, we want it on the cheap and we want it now. So, um, pre the attack surface is pretty fucking great, right? So, um, if you just uh, pretend to be a tier 069 client, i.e., a router ping going, hey, what's up, ISP? I'm a router. Here's my stuff. You know, you're sending a big blob of XML to a probably buggy parser. And so I sat down, and I hacked about a bit, and I created a valid CWMP notify, which is the first message a router sends the ACS. So I created one of those messages to fuzz with. And so, you know, like borrowed it from some bits and, you know, used other people's stuff and created this as kind of my test fuzzing packet. And I looked and went, oh, no. Oh, no, not, not XML. Make it stop. Make it go away. M no. Can we not just move to JSON? At least I can read JSON. I don't like these angle brackets. No, mate. So, no. I mean, it's hard enough to parse, you know, with computers. I mean, the hell with looking at that. It'll give you a headache. So, I tried fuzzing the XML, and my test box kept falling over, which is indicative of a denial of service bug somewhere. But it's XML, and XML is like denial of service bugs with an optional markup language thing that you can put gubbins in. So um, I got bored really fast, and I went, nah, this XML message stuff is a bit hard. This is too much effort for your 15-year-old threat model. So I said, eh, the XML, eh, no, too difficult. We'll come back to it if we don't find anything else. So I looked at the basic auth. You know, there was no auth header in that one, and I was like, this does some magic with the basic auth. I know, yes, it does. So the username in the basic auth field is used to denote what device. It's a device ID, because we use authentication as identification because we don't know our arse from our elbow. So it's used as a unique ID in a lot of cases. And free ACS is no different. So it's an input. It's an input field that we can play with. And it turns out basic auth lets you put a whole lot of crap in there, and it doesn't really care what you do. You know, you can. It's a pretty good fuzz vector for stuff like this. So um, this is what I mean by bugs in my bugs. So um, the basic auth username gets popped into a SQL query. There's no sanitizing. Sanitizing, you know, we haven't got there yet. These are enterprise Java developers. They're still stuck, you know, before SQL injection was a thing. Um, you know, somebody might want to let them know. So in theory, there's a lovely SQL injection there that's super trivial to exploit. Um, now, it turns out this slide's slightly wrong. I thought there was a character length limit, which was why it was breaking. I have no idea anymore. It's not a character length limit, because I put loads of crap in. And you can do the SQL injection. It's just that you don't get immediate output. It's blind. It's second order. It's a bit of a chore. Like, the injecting your SQL query is easy. The SQL query then executes, and you don't get any output but it doesn't execute immediately. It executes some arbitrary time in the future. So you'll need some kind of side channel gubbins or maybe make a really, really, really well-crafted SQL query to add a user or something, and no. Nah. But the funny bit is, is that if your SQL query syntax is not correct, the entire thing shits the bed and falls over and refuses to come back to life. I discovered this after resetting the VM, revert back to fucking snapshot a lot of times, and I got really sick of doing this. So I decided to look for something else. So as I said, the username of the basic auth, it's unsanitized, the username that a router sends. The username also pops up in the UI when the admin is in doing admin things in the admin thing. And they don't sanitize their SQLs, so, and we know it's basically made of XSS. So you know, I kind of started thinking, I might be onto something here. Yeah. So unauth client can send a thing that does XSS in admin land. You got some payload limitations. I don't think it's actually a character length anymore. I have no idea. But then I realized your cross-site scripting payload must not fuck up the SQL injection, SQL query gubbins. Otherwise, you screw the box. 
So you got some restrictions there because you've a bug within a bug. You've nested bugs. It's bugs all the way down like turtles in Discworld or some shit. Or not Discworld, in uh, Stephen King's magic planet world thing of Dark Towers. Um, so yeah, we got some problems. So when the admin logs in, they get an alert box. Cool, sweet. And then I thought to myself, well, I've got all these weird limitations, so I've got to do something cool with this XSS to do something interesting. So I loaded a remote script, and it worked fine. So test worked. So then I thought, how do I take over the ACS? Well, I had an admin user, because these people haven't heard of cross-site request forgery protections or any of that, so this will be easy, right? Except I'm lazy, and I hate JavaScript. Like, I refuse to write JavaScript for whatever reason. So um, I built the exploit by copy and pasting from Stack Overflow. And guess what? It works. So you send a post request um, when you're logged in, and it'll add an admin user. And again, yeah, just copy and paste from Stack Overflow, because I didn't want to write any JS, because sod that. I like to occasionally go outside and go to the pub and things, and I can't be arsed learning JS properly, so fuck it. Stack Overflow, mate. The JavaScript developer's Bible. So um, I wrote an exploit, and it works. So you inject your cross-site scripting payload, and then you wait a bit. Sysad logs in the next day to do ACS things. You can trigger the sysadmin logging in with an ISP by maybe ringing up their support helpline, and then they'll have to log in to do stuff. And then the payload fires, and it adds an admin user. And then it tells you, hey, buddy, I've added an admin user. This ISP is now yours. So um, game over for them, and really easy to do. So you know, you get a login that's an admin user, and yeah, you get added, and is admin flag is set to true, blah, blah, blah. So you've just wrecked that entire ISP in one go. You know, you'll have to go clean up your cross-site scripting afterwards, but that's outside the scope of board 15-year-old. They just want access, and they want it now. So yeah, you can log into the ACS, and you can play about with things, and you can do magic. So what do we do next? Well. If we're the script kitty, we scan the internet or we show down census, Google, Bing, binary edge, whatever way you like to find boxes to find the free ACS boxes. You spray out your cross-site scripting magic payload via the CWMP notify with no auth. And then on Monday, when ISP people come into work, they sit down, they log in, you own them. Wrecked. Game over. End. Planet hacked. So. Um, and then I started looking at, you know, free ACS, cool. So I looked at OpenACS and LibreACS, which is the world's shortest software audit. So the problem with these is the documentation shit, and I could barely get them to work. When they worked, they'd fall over all the time. I couldn't figure out if I was triggering a bug or if it was just software being crap, and it was kind of a bit of both. So I sat down with the setup guide, and for, like, making sure that testing is repeatable, when I set up a piece of shit software to break it, I set it up exactly as they tell you to do it because that's how most people will do it. And it's, you know, the, it's how the developers intended you to do it, how God said you should do it. It's JBoss, MySQL, shit docs, the usual. Um, step one, set up, blah, 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 start fuzzing and probing it, notice it freaks out. And then I stopped and I went, hold on a minute, this was a total pain in the ass to set up. I should look at the config, see if there's any problems there. Yeah, there is. So it's actually, I call it the misconfiguration server because um, it's JBoss based. Anybody familiar with JBoss will recognize these URLs. These are endpoints to give you remote code execution with no effort. So you can wreck them all. And it turns out that all the installer docs, you end up creating a MySQL root user with a blank password, which reminds me somewhat of what allegedly happened to a company called Stratfor. So you're getting fucked if you're using this stuff. Because it turns out that the blank password bit's hard-coded somewhere, so you have to go and do some magic to make it work. So yeah, we were able to pop shells all over the shop when I tested LibreACS and OpenACS. And that was a bit boring. And I was like, who wants to audit this shit? So I decided to look at another ACS piece of software, because I didn't want to bore you guys with like boring bugs from 10 years ago that still pop up because badmins can't badmin. Oh yeah, by the way, these are in the wild. There's a, there's a national ISP somewhere that runs this. There's a few others. Um, I stopped looking because I'd end up drunkenly popping some ISPs or something, you know, testing, is it really there? So I said, no, no, hands off. But these things are on the internet. And I think some are getting replaced after emails got sent, but pff, 
I doubt it, legacy stuff in it. So I want to break from Java. So I decided to look at another piece of ACS crap. I didn't want to look at any more Java. So I looked at this one in PHP. That's the GitHub link. PHP stuff to do stuff with Laravel um, to do ACS. It's written in PHP, so I had a quick look. Yeah. Basically this. Um, shit happens. This was, yeah. You don't just unserialize it once. You might as well unserialize it every time. And because Laravel is basically magic and auto loads a ton of crap in, you don't need to look through your application for like a magic pop gadget or a constructor or destructor because it turns out Laravel's auto loading will helpfully do this shit for you and give you loads of pop gadgets to create your PHP chain to get a shell. It's like it wants to help you. I mean, somebody once called PHP the HTTP API for remote code execution. They're not wrong. So, yeah, I mean, it's exploitable. There's a couple of ways you can mitigate, um, but nobody's going to do that because PHP devs, lol. I mean, even if you mitigated it by killing the pop chain, you could still use, you could, you'll find one of a trillion memory corruptions and unserialized, like how Pornhub got wrecked by the bug bounty people. Um, if you use this library, you're getting screwed. And people do use this library in production that was written by some guy as a little hobby project, a bit like OpenSSL and BigInt Maths. Um, you know, people's hobby projects become infrastructure. So what do we do with the hacked ACS? Well, the easy one is um, change everyone's DNS servers, do mass farming, maybe jack everyone's Wi-Fi keys, maybe change their NTP servers to screw with them, maybe reflash their firmware and change the ACS server URL in NVRAM so the only way to unscrew things is for the ISP to ship out new devices or send an engineer to every customer's house. Or you could mess with billing, provision new stuff, launch the biggest DDoS botnet in the world, whatever the hell you want to do. The world's your oyster. You're basically the poor man's NSA with a cross-site scripting bug and a few config issues, and the fact that you know everything's shit. So um, the defenses ISPs use, they try access restrict. That's a waste of time. They do, oh, it's on a management subnet. We pop one customer's router, it's game over. They do this mutual SSL alt stuff. Oh, we just pop one of your customer's routers, and again, you're screwed. Or they layer these defenses to do defense in depth, and you know, they still get fucked because they're relying on pieces of crap hardware that are made for like 20 cents. So yeah, it's game over. Mitigations aren't going to work. Just scrap the lot. Next on the agenda is this ongoing research. Um, audit more ACS servers. You should all audit an ACS server. There's a load of them out there. Every tin vendor out there has made one. Um, Audit more of the CPE and stuff. Um, there's some stuff out there that's not ROM pager. I know that Orange, the telco in France, have open sourced their tier 069 client bit gubbins and it's crap and it's written in C. Um, I need to look at tier 111, the smart TV stuff. Um, in the future, Sky, BT, Virgin, any of the crowds who do TV as well as ISP will probably implement this and it's got the same issues. So you can, you can write exploits for the future by looking at that. You know, you, you can be a time traveler. I know everyone wants to go back in time, you know, bring an O-Day back with them and hack the planet. You can do this right now. Um, yeah, yeah, just thanks to all these people and a whole bunch of others who aren't named um, for just helping me along with this. Yeah.